Now in part three, we're going to look at the fingerprints of God in the development of more complex life on the planet Earth, all the way up to the present. Now in part two, this is where we left off, and that was the development of cyanobacteria. So remember the bacteria and the archaea were the very earliest living forms to, to be developed, and the bacteria and the archaea still live today. Uh, and some of these bacteria from the earliest cells began to form chlorophyll, a chlorophyll-like substance, and they would begin to, to produce oxygen because of that. So the first life forms were microbes that climbed on these rocks and made mats and started to make, blue, they were called blue-green algae, and they, the rocks that they climbed on all covered with this matted bacteria was called strombolites. And they used some sort of form of photosynthesis early, and they uh, were able to do it by eroding the uh, rocks and obtaining the apparent the minerals they needed to do this process. The remaining earth all remain barren. So the question is, why did they start to make oxygen? They were anaerobic air organisms. They didn't need oxygen. That's a very good question. It must have been because somewhere another half a billion years or a billion and a half years, we're going to have to use, make a plant, a plant an animal called eukaryocytes. They're going to use oxygen. But it developed in the cyanobacteria way ahead of time. Now it's a pretty big deal when the eukaryotic single cells move into the multicellular development arena. What are the changes that happen, ha have to happen? Well, for one thing, you start getting sexual rep uh, replication rather than asexual. So this is no longer mitosis, but you have a male and female component. Now you're going to also begin with not only one cell, but you're going to deal with a whole series of germinal cells, which have to develop into mature cells with widely diverse functions. And what's the plan for that? The cells just divide, and then they divide again. And each time they start figuring out where they're going to go, which part is going to be an eye, which part is going to be an ear, which part is going to be an arm, and so on and so forth. All that has to be defined in the DNA. And these germinal cells have to, they all kind of look alike, but they all have to do something different. So where does this new DNA come from? It has to come from someplace, and there's no apparent reason, but all of a sudden you develop this new DNA to do all to run the germinal cells, to make a digestive system, a neural system, a metabolic system, skeletons, muscles, etc. Every new system you add requires new DNA, not just random adjustment of the prior DNA. Scientists recognize the differences in all the eukaryotic derived living things, but they cannot answer how it happened or why it happened. Now, to put in perspective what an amazing creation this event is to go from a single cell creature to a multicellular animal or plant is really quite amazing. So here's a challenge. Do you think it's easy? Try this. Fill, go to the sea, fill up a pail of sand with water and sand and put it on your porch and sit there and watch. And how long do you think it would be before a frog would hop out of that pail just by random chance, just sitting on your front porch, which is basic, or you could put it at right at the seashore, it doesn't matter. Nevertheless, I think it's impossible to believe that that could happen by random chance alone. It needs the creative touch, and that's exactly the point. Now we've watched the Earth, Earth's timeline and the development of living creatures. But now we've moved on to development of both types of plants and types of animals. So what has to have happened in here is the DNA in the plants is going to decide to make complex plants, and it's going to make marine plants, it's going to make seed-bearing plants, it's going to make trees. And every time any of these things happen, a significant change in the DNA has to happen. And the question is, who drives that? Well, you can't expect the little creatures without any brain to do it. It has to be a creative event. There's no reason why they would want to just move from one spot to another or change unless there's a, a cause. And it, each of these changes requires a significant alteration of their DNA. You have to add a whole lot of complex material to your DNA status to do anything. 
And the same is true of animals, because now we're going to get the single cells and multi-cell plants and then the animals, and then you get multicellular animals, and then you start getting actual oxygen-breathing animals and plants coming onto the earth, which is now cooled down to a usable level. You start getting fishes, then the tetrapods, then the insects, and so on. We'll get the rest of it later. After insects, we move on to the next era. And this is called the era of the dinosaurs and the large, large mammals. And this is called the Triassic part, uh, part, the Jurassic Park. Remember the movie Jurassic Park? Well, this is when these happened, and they come down to the last is the Cretaceous part. And you're going to get the small animals and the big animals developing. But uh, an asteroid hit the Earth, and whatever it produced in the atmosphere killed all the dinosaurs. So they never made it. But the little animals went on. Now, as the multicellular plants and animals came on land, beginning with the plants because they had to make the oxygen and they had to make the glucose before animals could even be derived. And there's all these divisions in time because it was not a real smooth sail. As you have a period of time, you would have an extinction that happens. For some reason, <coughs> there would be a change in the atmosphere or on land or temperature. All of them were related, and if it, close, it matches closely with the oxygen rising and falling. So each time one of these eras came along, there was an extinction that knocked off a lot of the plants and animals, and then they would recover, and then be knocked off and recover, or knocked off and recover, knocked off and recover. And the question is, how could they recover so easily? That's a very good question. How do they regenerate after six extinctions? Now, the last one was really dramatic. And the last one had almost 96% of the marine species, 70% of the terrestrial vertebral species all became extinct along with many of the plants as well. It turned out that the trees all died at this time, got resorbed into the ground, and this is where we get coal and oil from the ground at the present time. So there's this major extinction at the end, and then we'll move on to the next eras. But the question is, how did it all recover? That is truly a miracle. Now, we've talked about the six massive extinction events, eradicating a high percentage of plants and animals. Each time it recovered, but this time it came with new species. So were they just derived from the old species or not? So here's the current theory is Darwinian theory which says that the old species started to have transcription errors, errors. In other words, their DNA made little errors and bigger errors, and pretty soon you had a different plant, uh, plant or animal altogether. The other choice is that the species mate, and then you have a new species that's kind of a hybrid. And then natural selection would weed out the species that were weak. Here's the problems with Darwinian theory. Each new species should have its own should have mixed DNA, but do they? And we're going to find out that recent investigations suggest that that's not true. Now, the other problem is major transcription errors of anything cause the species seldom to survive. Most times, they're anomalous and die. The last is the problem of mitochondrial DNA. Well, here is that study we just talked about: is the DNA gene mitochondrial that has a specific, commonly used enzyme in DNA replication. And these authors looked at 100 different species from the gen bank, which is a storage of all previous life forms that are known. And what did they discover? The result was that they could not really support Darwinian evolution because the DNA was not mixed. The DNA was all separate, which suggests that there's a creation event for new species and they change in their appearance, all related species, by adaptive evolution. In other words, each species had to change a little bit depending on where they lived. So this shows that there was very little variation in the gene in 100 animal species. And that's true. They also looked at human beings. And they, the modern human beings differ from the early human beings in the apes, monkeys, and chimpanzees. So it does not appear that human beings have been derived from hominids. Now, this is the first time this study has been done, and it remains to be proven, but it certainly makes a lot of sense. 
Now finally we get to the Cenozoic era which began 66 million years ago and goes all the way up to the present. So beginning back in 66 million years ago the continents now formed separated by seas. It wasn't just one big landmass. The plants are kind of like today. The first primates to show up were the monkeys at about 55 million years ago. Then the apes and chimps about seven and a half million years ago. Then the earliest man but they're not hoping Homo sapiens like we are. They had different names. Began about 1.5 million years ago. Then finally you get to the fossil record of 200,000 years ago where you start having Homo sapiens show up and we call the the people then the Y chromosome Adam and the mitochondrial Eve. So those are our first great 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 grandparents. Now here's what we mean. If we look at the geological timeline for Homo sapiens. So these are upright men like us, but they have a different character. Beginning about 200,000 years, going up to 75,000 years, these were the initial Homo sapiens, so they're all the same Homo sapiens, but this group was confined to northern Africa. They left no trace other than their skeletons. They seemed to function similar to chimpanzees. So they didn't really do anything, so there's no record of them whatsoever except bones. But at 75,000 years, a dramatic functional change called the ensouling process. So this, at this time, man all of a sudden developed language. They could talk with syntactic language. That cave art buried their dead with amulets as if there was a next world. They had a sense of the hereafter. They had counting sticks so they were understanding math, began to form colonies, and began migrating around the world. In essence, they acquired what we call a human soul. To do all this requires a very sophisticated change in brain function. So the brain function changes between here and here, which is a very short time, and it happens very quickly right at the 75,000 year timeline. And from here, we go all the way down to the present. About 10,000 years from now, you begin to get historical records of where people lived. So we, we know a lot from 10,000 down to the present because people left all kinds of remnants, uh, tools, and buildings, etc. All of these people created a history. Now let's look a little bit more into what we mean by the idea of soul. Our soul is a very unique part of all of us. It's very real, but when you look at the brain, which I've done for many years as a doctor uh, dealing with uh, imaging of the brain, uh, we can never find it. I know where I can find sensation, movement, memory, language, vision, heart and breathing functions, even personality. We all have a place in the brain that they're found, but not the soul. It appears to be part of the human spirit. Now what does that mean? The human sp spirit, which is called our soul, is what creates self-awareness. We're aware of our surroundings and our purpose in life, things like that. It gives us a sense of goodness. We know what's good and bad. We know what a sense of love is. When we talk about more than just physical love, we're talking about getting along with people and loving your neighbor. The sense of beauty. We know what art looks like. Sense of doing the right thing. Sense of doing the wrong thing. We know when we're doing the wrong thing. Then a sense of distinguishing truth from falsehood. So what all this ends up being is it gives us a sense of well-being. We can look at our life. And do we have purpose? And have we made a difference? Do we think we've done the right thing with our lives? Our soul is what connects us to God, our Creator. We are so glad our soul allows us to sense God's presence through the Holy Spirit. God is all around us in nature, and God is accessible through prayer and scripture. We call the Bible God's love letter to his creation. Our final thought, God, our Creator, fine-tuned the universe just like a guitar works. You want to play a guitar, you want it to sound good and make music. Well, God wanted the universe to be creative, to reproduce, to change with time, depending on whatever happens. That's called adaptive evolution. But now if we look at the idea of fine-tuning, look at the guitar. What did God do? What did our Creator do? He created all the laws of physics for everything to work. He designed some wood to be resonant. He made metal that can be stretched into a wire and vibrate at a specific pitch or sound. 
what did science do? It discovered you can make a box out of wood. Here's the box. You can stretch wires out. There go the wires. And you can tune them so you can sing and play as long as those strings are perfectly in tune. So here's an example. Here's what a guitar sounds like when it's in tune. That sounds real nice. Well, what if I, if the strings don't match? What if they're out of tune? What does it sound like? That's being out of tune. But the whole, the whole physical universe is all designed to be in tune with each other. So we were able to play music and live in a wonderful world. Now, all we've talked about isn't just theoretical. For instance, for the Big Bang, where space was created, planets and stars. So tonight, go outside at night, close your eyes at first, look up at the sky on a clear night, and then open your eyes. And what you will see is the vastness of the universe and realize that it came into being in just an instant of time and it was created out of nothing. And we are a part of it now. Well, what about the supernova and the elementary stardust? This is elementary means it's the origin of all our elements. They came out of nothing too. So if we go and look at, go online, and look up the Hubble spacecraft data about the universe and look at the pictures. And what you will notice is that the whole building blocks of our world, all the essential elements, are floating around in stardust mixed up in space. And they're produced by these real bright stars called supernova. These are the ones that are real hot. They collapsed. They got so hot and they compressed everything because of gravity. And it blasted out in space the stardust that contained all of the essential elements from billions of years ago just for us to be used today. We can find the Nifty Nebula because they look like this. You can find pictures, and this is one of the pictures from NASA, just right here. And what happens is mind-boggling, but if you realize that this little astronomical system collected the stardust, you can see it around it, and it put it into this disk, the center of which became the sun, the periphery became the planets, and it put our planet exactly at the right distance from the sun. It's called the habitable distance. That's mind-boggling when you think about it. Well, what about the dynamic DNA? which is the instruction manual for all living cells. Well, we can go look at our cell phone and just think about what's in the cell phone. You've got the outer case, and inside it, you have the battery to give it power. That would be like the mitochondria. But it has this part here, the little computer. And the computer is the same as the little computer in all your cells, which is the DNA. And that's what makes all of our systems work. Well, what about those jolly green chloroplasts? Parts of the green are the, the parts that make the plants green and who make our oxygen. So just go outside on a nice day, look up at the sky, look at the green trees outlined against the sky, and you can see all this all this material, this chloroplast material, make took the carbon dioxide out of the air, added a little sunlight, and made both sugar, glucose, so that we can we need glucose to run our body as fuel but it also made the oxygen that filled up our atmosphere so we could breathe. This little chloroplast has its own DNA, which is a miracle in itself. It's certainly a creative event. But you realize that all the stuff that's green, every little plant, every little tree, is contributing to our atmosphere so that we can breathe. We have to be pretty thankful for that. Well, the sixth creative event was the making of the mitochondria. The mighty mitochondria, these are energy engines for life. The mitochondria takes nutrients, takes them into the cell, it takes them into the mitochondria, and because it has its own DNA, its own instruction manual, nuclear DNA is over here and that makes the parts, but the mitochondrial DNA makes the energy to do anything. So a good example, go ahead and put your hand over your heart and feel that beating. Without the mitochondria, it would not beat or exist at all. You watch your dog run through the yard, 
That's because all the mitochondria are working overtime for him to have fun. Now the last step of our seven creation events is the spark of life. So if you add up all the parts created by the DNA, the chloroplast, the mitochondria, all the elements, space, time, etc., and put it all together, what's the probability that it would all fuse together to make life as we know it? That's kind of the same as this analogy. What do you think would happen if you have a junkyard full of trash like this and a tornado rips through it? What's the probability at the other end of it, after it passes, you have an airplane all shiny and ready to go with a pilot full of gasoline and ready to fly? That would be an example of random activity. Or you could see a God creator took the trash, took the power, and it was created. That's the difference. So you can look around your world and recognize the fingerprints of our creator. They're just everywhere. And you realize that we recognize that, that God is the instigator of all this. He is the creator because he's been giving us a soul that makes us sensitive and recognize God's part in our life. We've finished all three parts of the creative events. There are seven major creative events, the Big Bang, the supernova creating the stardust with the elements in it, the nebulae creating our sun and our planet, our planet Earth with all the other little planets, but our Earth got all of the important essential elements, all 94 of them. And then when we had the early life forms, they came out of a primordial soup that was just totally toxic. And why did they appear? That is a creative event for sure. And they began to have DNA put into a nucleus. They began to have chloroplasts put into the cells that became plants. They began to have mitochondria, all of them, animals and plants, so they had an energy. Then we moved on to the multicellular plants, animals. Then we got the more sophisticated ones, and we had a bumpy course through a lot of those early eras where you had extinction events and every time all the plants and animals came back. The question is, do they all come back as do creations or do they come back as just evolved parts of the previous creations? That's a good question. And now we have studies that are beginning to look at that and see what the reality is. And the most recent studies suggest that they're all new. They're all new creations. There's no mitochondrial DNA that overlaps between the species to suggest there was transition from one to another. So we're very glad to have a soul, which finally allowed us as human beings to have a sense of God's presence through the Holy Spirit. We now, our soul also gives us the ability to have self-awareness, a sense of purpose, and what we want to do with our life and how is it going. So that this is a sense of well-being, which is a very important part. And that, too, is a spiritual part of our life. It doesn't have a specific spot in the brain like everything else does. So God is all around us. God is accessible through prayer and scripture. God has written. His fingerprints are written in the history of our entire universe and our creation and our world. We know, and finally, we can look at scripture, the Bible, which is God's love, love letter to his creations.